Okay, do you, do you guys see my slides? We, sure, we see your slides, yes. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to talk about Peer Models Network. Um, so this is my disclosure and acknowledgement. Um, I have to mention that this is an absolute teamwork, especially with the involvement of uh, Stephanie Harvard, a postdoctoral fellow in our lab, and Amin, uh, our very capable data analyst and programmer. So I want to give you a little bit of a story. Uh, I got a grant in 2015. In in, it was about developing a, a discrete event simulation, a whole disease models for chronic, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. Uh, many of us have walked this path, so um, I'm sure I'm not, uh, I'm like a kind of, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but it's a discrete event simulation. The core engine was written in C++. The interface was written in R. It's relatively complex piece of code because it was like really a multi-purpose uh, disease model with around 4,000 lines of R code and 4,000 lines of C and C++ code. In our granting uh, applica grant application, we made a pledge to the funding agency that uh, in the spirit of open science, we wanna make this model open source and freely and easily accessible to all the stakeholders that are out there. So when time came in 2019, when we were publishing the main report on this model, we did put the code on GitHub. We did put the model on this uh, Tuft University CAA clearing house. And uh, so the code is there. Uh, and again, all bits of it are publicly accessible. Um, but again, like when you are dealing with a complex model, if it is a simple model, like I imagine that a peer reviewer of my, uh, any cost effectiveness analysis based on this model or any report that I send to for, for my subsequent grants might actually roll up their sleeves and, and review my code and see what's going under the hood. But when you're talking about nearly 10,000 lines of code, I mean, it is important to be transparent. It is important to be open source, but I would say there is also a little bit of virtue signaling there uh, because practically I would say that it's improbable that any person even with the best of intention in their mind would review for 8,000 lines of somebody else's code for the sake of understanding how um, my model is functioning and if there are mistakes or bugs or misassumptions in the code. So when a model uh, or any piece of software gets so complex, uh, so our motto is that it is accessibility becomes the real transparency. Any piece of code at this level of complexity is, is a black box at certain stage, whether we want it or not. And it is important to make the code accessible, this black box accessible to the end users so that they can so-called interrogate my model, play with the input and output relation, try to decipher how it works and, and if there is, it passes face validity and internal validity test, or they might find an uh, error somewhere and cause trouble for us. But that's, that's uh, the situation for complex models. It is accessibility that's really, really uh, what matters in um, making the, uh, the model truly uh, amenable to open science and peer review. So in the accessibility department, we were trying to do our job. We turned Epic into a proper R package. Um, but again, given the size of the model and all the dependency, this is, for example, the last time I was trying to install Epic um, on my uh, R, on my PC, like, oh, I still get an error. Some of them are very difficult to uh, resolve. This, I guess, has something to do with conflicts between packages. So yes, it is doable, but it's not still accessible to everybody out there. All the stakeholders, not all of them are um, sophisticated uh, R users. And um, the question uh, at this stage is, yeah, Mohsen, you should develop a sh nice looking shiny app for your model, put it out there, make it truly accessible to the public. And that's absolutely a fantastic solution. No question about that, but we wanted to go a little deeper um, and provide a proper application programming interface or API to uh, our model that is gonna sit still on the cloud, yet still be accessible to people on the client side. So a proper API has certain features that is appealing over and above uh, a shiny app. First of all, it gives programmatic access to my colleagues. My, some of them are very near and very technical. 
and they want to like have programmatic access to my model for interrogation and review. That is not something that Shiny provides by default. Uh, I might have HTA clients say at British Columbia Ministry of Health that they are well versed in Excel. They don't even have R installed on their system. They, they are working with Excel models over many years. They still want to have an Excel interface to my model. They save their scenarios that they run in a different spreadsheet and they copy and paste it into the input sections and, and run the model over and again. So a proper API that is client agnostic can keep the model on the cloud, provide that certain functionality to the client. If I have a precision medicine model that uh, takes patient characteristics, calculates say the Framingham risk score for the 10 year cardiovascular mortality risk and decides on the fly that if statins or aspirins are cost effective for this patient, it is not unimaginable that you know an EMR system want to have real function call to my model and do this on the fly. So a proper integration of uh, a decision model within patient care, it is uh, something that might happen in the new near future. So uh, the, the typical version of Shiny, as beautiful, as useful as it is, does not provide a proper API functionality. There are versions of Shiny that do that, but uh, you have to pay a large sum of money every year to the company and the entire pipeline, pipeline is a little bit of a black box. But well, we wanted to create something that is open source as, and freely accessible to our flow programmers. And this is what we did on top of uh, the COPD grant that I mentioned. We call the service Programmable Interface for a Statistical and Simulation Models or PRISM. It is part of the Peer Models Network. The Peer Models Network is a broader enterprise uh, my colleagues are involved and they want to make the models transparent, not just the code, but also the assumptions, the value judgment that goes into that. But this today talk is about one technical aspect, uh, putting the model on the cloud and provide an API functionality to the model for the client side, no matter what the client software is. So these are the basic uh, characteristics of the technology. It is a stateless server. So an R model, if it turned into a proper R package, can be hosted on Prism and can be made available to the public. Uh, by a stateless, I mean that whenever somebody makes a function call to the model, a, a, an R process starts from scratch, run that model, returns the results, and then that R process dies. So it is a stateless, unlike say Shiny that uh, always keeps an R process alive on the server. So if I uh, upload my input parameters, press the run button and go for a coffee break and come back, if somebody else has run the model after me, I might see the results of that somebody else model run uh, in, the, in the standard version of Shiny because it's a single thread server process. Whereas the technology that we have worked on, it's uh, specific to end user because it is a stateless and does the job and, and then the R just dies and, and awakens again for the next user. It is based on RESTful API technology, which is industry standard for HTTP calls. The data are transferred between the client and server using JSON format, which as you know, it's a very standard formatting for um, data. Um, we have customized management via API keys. So there are hierarchy among users. There might be a standard users who see certain part of the model or can, can call certain parts of the model. There are power users that can run the model with uh, more fully fledged functionality. Uh, and there are also provision for synchronous versus asynchronous run. So if, if I have a complex model that might take two, three hours to run, uh, my client software doesn't have to be frozen uh, for two, three hours. They can actually submit the job. It goes to a scheduler and two, three hours later, they get an email that, oh, your, your results are ready and now you can download your results. So that's the motivation behind developing this technology. Each model that goes uh, on the server is, has a homepage there. For example, this is uh, the homepage for EPIC, the COPD microsimulation model that I mentioned to you. Uh, we are to, again trying to, in the spirit of transparency in the broader scene, we're trying to make the model transparent to uh, broader stakeholders. We have educational videos, what a, what a simulation model is, but EPIC is in particular. Um, EPIC again has turned into an R package. 
this is, for example, I can show you if time allows that uh, this is an Excel sheet that communicates with the R model on the cloud, provide that Excel functionality that there is a still a large user base out there that, uh, uh, that is familiar with that. We have a user guide uh, for how to call the model. Uh, so how does it look on the client side? Um, we are developing an R package called Peer Models um, that uh, enables uh, you know, seamless communication with our servers. Um, this is still in development, but at some point we hope that we can put it on CRAN, but it's already available uh, from GitHub. Maybe I should, uh, I think I'm good with time. Maybe I should just pause my screen here and share it again. Um, and this time share my R Studio in a stance and show this in action. If you guys see my R Studio. See this, yeah. uh, so, uh, I, uh, I call the uh, library, the warning I think comes from the previous ranking of the code. Um, so the I am given an API key that I can call the model. In this case, my model is Epic. This is a standard function. We were talking about a standardizing or metaprogramming and R function. I think that would be very relevant to an activity of this type. But as far as I know, because there are no standards out there, we try to adhere to some minimal conventions. For example, every model should have a get default input function. What it does, it uh, get the input structure from the server, like the, the R is now talking to the model on the cloud and gets uh, the, the input structure that, that the Epic models work with. For example, one parameter that I have is a time riser. So I know that uh, if I go to model input, uh, and I see that the model, if the time horizon of the model at this stage is uh, 20 years, what if I want to change it to 10 years and then uh, again run another standard API call to the server, uh, which in this case is um, the standard function called model run. So I am, this is again part of the peer models network package. I am communicating with Epic, running the model on the server. So it sends the input parameters uh, uh, as a JSON package to the server and running the model. And getting the results back in a standard R list. So this is coming from, um, uh, as, a, as you can see, the, this is the result uh, as an R list that is coming back from the server. It has a status variable trying to adhere to minimum standards. Returning zero, it means that uh, there was no error in content on the server. So I can uh, I can access all the results. Uh, for example, this is the cumulative time of patients in the model, uh, and uh, and any like any other model, if the server has some drawing, they are available to me as a client, and I get, for example, graphical output from my model. The model sits on the cloud. Nothing was installed on my client package. So that was main purpose of, again, API functionality. This is the R side of things. Um, I don't know, James, how am I doing with time? Uh, you've still got five minutes. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to be brave and uh, share no like uh, the Peer Models Network web web website itself. Uh, if I go to model repository page, this is the Epic homepage that I mentioned to you. And uh, for those of us who have a PC, uh, Excel for some reason, uh, thanks to Microsoft, the, the Excel on PC and Mac are not fully compatible in the visual basic library. Again, this is another interface to the same model. This is the Epic model on the server. Uh, this Excel sheet is really a shell. It doesn't have any code from the model itself. It has set in a standard um, a visual basic library that knows how to communicate uh, to the peer model network server. So I can connect to the model. Uh, you see there is a setting function. I have my API. Oh, sorry, Mosin, we're only seeing your web page. Oh, uh, thanks. Uh, okay. Uh, there we go. This is what I get. Again, an Excel 
shell without any model code for any, for any functionality of the model. They're only a set of visual basic code that knows how to communicate with the server. Uh, I can communicate to the model. So it tells me that it's successfully connected to the model. I'm gonna do the same thing that I did there. The time horizon is uh, in a set of 20 years, I make it 10 year. It follows a very simple convention. You see the name cell here. If, you, if, if the Excel sheet follows this convention, it knows which input parameters should change. And then I go to the results section and I call. So it's running the model on the server through the API key that I had. And it got the result back and it populated all the results into the spreadsheet. So my Excel friendly clients still have access to the model on the cloud without having to have R in a start or without having to have the, the Epic package specifically in a start on the server. So on this front, I wanted to say that, yeah, we, uh, I, we hope that through this activity, we have uh, uh, added some functionality on top of what uh, like Shiny provides. This is still a work in progress. We, our plan is in the spirit of, uh, open science and uh, transparency and open source software, the entire server pipeline will be open source itself and it will be put on GitHub soon so that everybody in, everybody who wants to use this, install the server structure on their own local network, they definitely can do that. Right now, if you have an R model that is packageable as an R package, you are more than welcome to let us know and we can host the model for you and provide this functionality that I mentioned to you. Um, we are working on documentation that are that definitely a work in progress in terms of know that we are putting the models on the cloud while not taking advantage of uh, cloud computing, for example, in terms of parallel processing, certain functionalities, DES models, probabilistic analysis, they are quite, uh, I would say, parallel, amenable to parallel computation. So let's do that and also have proper user tracking and usage tracking and logging system. These are all standing issues in this Server, I want to conclude my talk by thanking you for your attention and telling that this is really something that we want to contribute to the community. We are not owners of this uh, technology and, and it wouldn't be complete without feedback uh, with, from the people who are actually out in the trenches developing these R models and any suggestion on any aspects of this is, is welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bozen, for a fascinating presentation. Um, we, just have, we just have time for one question, and Donnie has put in the chat, um, just wondering how easy it was to get the API to link up to EHR data. Uh, yeah, it's at this stage, it's a dream, but uh, I, have, I have submitted a grant to our national funding agency that if it gets funded, we are actually linking uh, EPIC the model into Cerner uh, EHR system, which is what BC hospitals are using. Uh, and I, I, am, I have received encouraging news from the Cerner technical team that their system is fully compatible with RESTful API calls. I would say as, as dreamy as it sounds, it's actually quite doable. The technology is there. If you have the right model and the right EHR system, uh, we are very positive about it. And I think this is this is next stage in, in modeling. Decisions do not have to happen only at the policy level. They are happening at the patient care level. And maybe we can bring the decision analytics there too. Thanks very much, Mosin.